Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Claywright Workshop. You caught me doing my research. Today, we're going to do something that I have enjoyed doing for a very long time. One of my favorite animals. And I know you guys are pretty sharp, so I want you to guess. And I'm going to give you a hint. Guess what animal we're going to do today. Ah, I bet you guessed already. You betcha. We're going to do an elephant. All right, now this is a pot that I had around the studio, and I put two elephant heads on it. All right, the pot already existed. I sculpted the elephant heads, and I put it on. Just like over here on my far right, there was a small pot, and I put a dragon onto it. So, as I mentioned on when we come in, we do pottery, sculpture, drawing, painting. We just celebrate all the arts here. Now, the elephant, the reason I was doing research, there are two major types of elephants. The African elephant, I'm showing off my education, called Loxodonta africana, okay? And of course, the, elephant, uh, the Asian elephant called Elephus maximus, okay? I personally like, as you might well tell by looking at this other finished piece of sculpture here, this is one in what we call the bisque stage, B-I-S-Q-U-E, the bisque stage, it recently came out of the kiln um, this morning, as a matter of fact. And this is an African elephant, and I have studied the anatomy. They're different so much that I can tell the difference. A few minutes from now, you're going to be able to tell the difference, too. Now, boy, I hope I don't mess this up because I'm using kind of permanent markers here. But let me give you an idea of what we're up to. When we make the body, I'm going to do the African elephant first because it's my favorite and it's the biggest, and when we men, big is better. Here we go. With the African elephant, you see my grid here, A, B, C, D, E. I've kind of broke it up. On the African elephant, the backbone maxes out there on B, drops down. All right? Then, I'm double-checking everything, you bet, slopes through here. It maxes out right about the ear here on D, and then the whole head, as you can see, of course, he's got his head up, but it slopes down. He's kind of flat-headed. There we go. And here comes his trunk. All righty. Now, it's highest here in the shoulder, and the African elephant has, of course, the large ears. One of the ways you can look quickly and tell the difference is an African uh, elephant's ear looks like the continent of Africa. Okay, now the underbody, it swopes upward, and it has no chin. So you've got this big circle, and it's in the rear, where the Asian elephant is in the middle. All right, we come out of here, kneecap, we go down to the toes, front shoulder, front shoulder is high on this guy, kneecap, the foot widens at the bottom. Now, everybody knows about the tusks. The tusk, as you see here on my white elephant and the other ones, are actually teeth. These bad boys, they run about 100 pounds now. And what's really cool, when I was doing the research, I found out that um, I thought that only the male elephants had these, but come to find out the male and female. And the trunk is so heavy, they sometimes will rest their trunk on their, uh, their big tusk here, which are the big teeth. Uh, the maximum record is 250 pounds. And, of course, we made a lot of things out of elephant's tusk back before synthetics. Uh, elephant, uh, the ivories on a piano and billiard balls. That's why sometimes someone calls, I'm playing the piano, I'm tickling the ivories. Now, the uh, African elephant, they all have very small eyes, have a very large ear, and when they flap their ears, it's to keep cool. The blood rushes through their ears. They flap them. It takes the temperature down 7 to 15 degrees, and that blood flows through the body. So it's, oh, girlfriend, I got the vapors. So they're fanning themselves to be cool. These bad boys are heavy. They weigh like... 8,000 pounds now. The record is an African elephant that weighed 25,000 pounds. Now, with the large trunk, they can reach up to a height of 25 feet. This is the largest land mammal. This is a big boy. This is bad. They've got these nice cushioned feet, and they can walk almost silently, which would be scary. You know, you're in the jungle. What's that? When well, you turn around, and there's this thing about the size of a Hummer, right? But they do. They walk very, very silently, and they communicate in very low decibels. 
that humans can't hear, that 1500 megahertz and down, so they can communicate and we not hear them. Now I'm going to start sculpting. The red line here was the African. I'll later go back and show the Asians a little different. I'll switch to another color. I have another color. I am so prepared. Those years in the Boy Scout worked out good. The Asian elephant is highest at number C, slowly swooping off. It drops down here at the shoulders, right? The top of the head is higher there. The ears are smaller, the trunk and so forth being about the same. So the Asian has a smaller ear, uh, legs rough. Asian elephants' uh, legs are a little bit bigger. But the body slopes off from C and it goes up higher here. They got the higher forehead. The um, bones in the forehead have air in them because it is such a massive head to help hold that head up. The trunk can hold about three and a half gallons of water. And they put the water in the trunk and then, bap, go inside. Now, what I'm going to try to show you, and this is going to be a two parter, those that watch my show on a regular basis. Know that sometimes I'll do a complete simple piece of sculpture and just one uh, half hour show with you. But I'm going to have two shows on elephants so I can teach you as much as is possible. All right, here we go. The best place to start is in the beginning. All right, so just like I've used the analogy many times, the largest part here, of course, is the body. Then to me would be the legs and then the head. So what we're going to do is I'm going to make the body. Now I've simplified this. We'll get our uh, white clay out. I've simplified this the way you learn to draw or do math. You reduce it to the lowest common denominator. All right. That body is basically just a big ball. All right. This is good old white earthenware clay. I'm going to slice just a little bit of this clay off. Move it here out of our way. Now, this is about like a sandwich cube. I'm going to roll this into a cylinder. Now, elephants live to be between 60 and 70 years old. Pretty cool. The herds are run by women, believe it or not. I didn't know that. The uh, matriarch, as they call her. The, men, uh, the male elephants, when they get mature, they go out, visit other herds, etc., fight, whatever men do. Uh, and the women traditionally, or the, the leading female, the matriarch, as she's called, uh, is usually in charge of the herd. All right? See this? We've turned it into a cylinder. Now, we take our favorite proctology stick. We go right up the bottom, and I'm going to turn this solid cylinder into a tube. So what I'm doing is I am manipulating or altering the shape, all right? Somebody said the word unsophisticated was defined as staying in its natural state. I guess when you get sophisticated, you change, all right? I'm not sophisticated. I haven't changed. Notice here that it's a hollow tube. Now, what I'm going to do, as we've done many times before, when we're making the sculpture such as you see behind me, the horse and the fish and the faces, we're using the pinch pot technique. And what I just did was I sealed this bottom hole. Now I'm going to seal the top. And in essence, what I'm doing is I'm trapping air inside. I think the... Uh, rock and roll group Led Zeppelin, you start thinking, you know, Zeppelin made out of lead probably wouldn't fly very high. Well, this is a clay balloon. It's a hollow cylinder, and I'm going to roll it. And as I just showed you with my drawing, this body is very teardrop shaped. Now, some people have graphic recognition. They can look at something, and I love this, and they are not distracted by detail. They see the primary shape. There was a semi-funny joke when I was growing up as a child, and the joke was, why do firemen wear red suspenders? And we'll be thinking about that. Geez, fire trucks are red, fire is red. Why do firemen wear red suspenders? And the answer was, to keep their pants up. 
So you don't let the color throw you. you suspenders, that's the important thing. So a lot of times when I'm working with young children that have not had the training, they're confused with details and they start telling me about the wrinkles and this and that. And I'm trying to get focused on here and now and not be thinking too far ahead, you know, decorating castles in the sky. Let's build the one here on the mountain. All right, there's my body shape. Now I'm going to put that aside so it can begin to dry. And I'm going to make the legs. Of course, it has four legs. And this is a, a very, very simple trick. As a matter of fact, any trick that I know is a simple trick. Uh, the American uh, humorist, Will Rogers, used to stand on stage, and while he was doing his humor, he would, being a cowboy, he would do little rope tricks. He would lasso his hand and spin it and whatever. And he said, I'm going to do a little rope trick for you. And then he stopped and he thought a minute and he said, I have to do a little rope trick because there is no big rope trick. Well, kind of this way here, all of these things are very simple. Now this is so simple, the more it sounds like I'm jerking your chain, this is so simple you may not see what I'm doing, all right? Watch, my hands are coming apart like tug of war, all right? Then I'm rolling across the top like you slipped on a banana peel. So some of the young students I work with, they press down like they're swatting flies, won't work. Got to be a glancing blow. And you see my hands pulling apart. Well, in a very, very short time, this will begin to grow. Now I have, without joking, because sometimes I exaggerate, no, don't argue, it's true. Uh, but I have literally rolled miles and miles of coils. And if you're watching, you see this bad boy getting longer. All right? Now, I'm looking back at my body, the elephant body that we made earlier, and I've got to consider several things. Some are logic, some are math, some are art, some are science. I'm reading some philosophy now, and uh, Bertram Russell said, there is no concept or idea so simple that concentrating on it for an hour won't make it complicated. And sometimes things are so simple that we make them complicated. Well, I'm not trying to make this complicated. Now, when you want several things the same size, I'm going to cut this off, put it aside. Again, I'm looking at the body, and I'm looking legs proportioned to the body. Now, these are a little bit fat or big. So I'm going to do the final touch-up. Now, without professional training, most people would try to put the legs under the elephant the way you would put legs under a table. That won't work. Although when I was doing the research recently, it said that the elephant, unlike the horse or other four-legged animals whose legs go at an angle to the body, you know, slightly out, the elephant does have his weight coming straight down on its leg. The elephant is the only animal that can't jump. And that's so cool, not that I mean, well, why does it need to jump? But it can't jump. Kangaroo can't walk. It can only jump. All right, this is about the size I want. Now, what I mentioned earlier by telling the bad jokes about simplicity, we're going to do some very, very simple math. Now, traditionally, I would cut it in half and then cut it in half again. All right? That way, I have four equal parts. By the way, this tool here has no edge and no point. It is politically correct. It has no edge and no point. Now, strangely enough, Instead of leaving these legs solid, I'm going to make them hollow. Now, what surprises most people, the hollow will actually be stronger. Again, I use the term the proctology stick, but it's you just go right up the bottom. I can't think of a better word that means go right up the bottom. Here we go. It's gone through. I'm making it hollow. One, it will dry faster. There she blows. Okay. It'll dry faster because now air can get to the inside. All right. You know my trick where my hands are pulling out. I'm in the 
I'm in the uh, artist in residence program and I travel all over the state. I've been invited to a couple of others. And I go and I do these tricks in the classroom. And it is so much fun. I am telling you, kids, they say the darndest things. And when I'm teaching the children some of these tricks, uh, I have taught literally tens of thousands of students. I quite often, whoa, I was suicidal, it jumped. I'm quite often surprised the questions that they ask me. Each person sees things from their own point of view. We always have to remember this. We can only see with our own eyes and interpret things with our own mind. And all of us have prejudices and images and learning styles. So when you go to uh, tell somebody something, I know you're listening to what I said, but I'm not sure you heard what I meant. All right, that was said in the 60s, and we thought it was poetry back then. But as a teacher, quite often I know that when I'm looking at something in my mind's eye, you know, I'm, ta I'm thinking about the house I used to live in or a pet I used to have, I get such a very strong visual image. I'm a visual thinker. And I realize that when a lot of people are talking to me, they can see what they're saying, but I can't see it. I cannot see into their mind's eye. Quite often with very young people, they're trying so hard to uh, explain to me what they're seeing that I'll come up just to be humorous, a little physical comedy, and I'll ask them to hold still and be quiet, and I will look in their ear and say, I can't see it. And the point that I'm belaboring is, I can't see the image in your head. That's why you saw me do the sketch on the board, or you saw me using my... Um, notes and textbooks so I use a lot of books and sketches the way most professional artists do and someone without training wants to tell you the vision well that's like telling you about their dream you know I'm never going to be able to see your dream as vividly as you did all right now I have the four legs I had to make a new one they're roughly about the same size now I'm going to begin to texture this in a moment. Some assembly is required. I'm going to make the uh, legs, probably adhere them to the body. Now, I don't know how much we can get done. I didn't want to rush through this, so if not, I will finish it next week, and I'll show you the face. The body's relatively simple. Now, as I mentioned, I'm not going to have the legs um, stand right under the body. They're going to go up on the hips, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to use, ha, I thought I had every tool I was going to need handy. Here it is. I'm going to use a square stick, and I'm going to go across this leg, again, like you slip on a banana peel, and I'm going to put a series of interesting textures that will look like the wrinkles on the uh, elephant skin. And this also will speed up the drying. Elephants, of course, are very wrinkled. A lot of people don't know that elephants are very hairy. Uh, and doing the research, and I, I love this, uh, it was talking about elephants uh, throw dust. They use their trunk for everything. It's called a hand. It's called an arm. It's called another foot. But they use it for all kinds of things, and it has between 40 and 150,000 muscles in it. That's incredible. The human body, we only have about 600. So that one trunk alone has between 40 and 150,000 muscles. And there's two little appendages called fingers on the end of the trunk. And there are so many muscles, and it's so delicate. This is way cool. I love this. They can pick a single berry. Is that cool? They can pick a berry with this trunk. And they can pick up a line and sling them against the wall like dirty laundry. I mean, it is an incredible thing. They can hold about three gallons of water in it. So that's a, a very important appendage. All right, got the wrinkles on the legs. Now, just for the hay of it, I've done this before in other animals. I don't have well you can see this, but you can see it now. I'm going to take my hand, ah, the way I would choke myself, with this curve here. I think it's called a potter's rib. And I'm going to press on the lower leg, and it's going to make the foot pad come out. If you can get in close enough, you'll see it makes a wonderful little elephant pad. Now, this is like one of those comedians telling you a joke. I told you all of this so I can show off a little bit, show off that wonderful education that I have. I read a book once. 
if I ask someone, how many toes does an elephant have? Uh, the children in the classroom, they all begin to guess. Three, four, five, sixteen, none, whatever. And I'm going to go over to the board here and show you guys something. Okay? An African elephant, an African forest elephant, has five toes on the front. Five. And four on the back. You know that? Five and four, all right? So does an Asian uh, elephant, five and four. But an African bush elephant has four on the front and three on the back. Isn't that cool? I bet you didn't know that, did you? We're learning stuff every day. People hang out with me, I'm telling you, they step on my IQ, they step on my shadow, their IQ goes up five points. All right. So now you know something you didn't know before. Now, um, I use a lot of sophisticated tools. I love this tool. It looks like a magic marker. It fools a lot of people. There's a hole on the end, and the top has striation marks. I'm going to use that on the trunk. But by pressing this, it makes wonderful little toes. Now, I could have added the toenails on, I could have carved them in, but this is called manipulating, all right? Those people that are married understand what it means to be manipulated. You can have things added to you, such as guilt. You can have things taken from you, such as money and freedom, and you can be manipulated. All right, for those who are not married, we'll just use these as sculpting terms. Manipulate means you alter the shape of something. Add is when you add to and subtract when you whittle away. Those are the three ways that we sculpt. Now, here is the body. I'm going to go ahead and begin to texture the body. I'm going to use this simple fork for right now. Again, that's going to help it to dry out. It's adding texture. Now you'll notice over here on my left, the elephant that is finished has a great amount of texture. If you guys come in real close, everybody hopefully will be able to see this. There's a lot and a lot of texture. And the next show, I'm going to stain this guy so that you can see all of that neat, great texture. All right? Now, the elephant we're making now is a little smaller because of time restraints. All right. Now remember, I said I'm not going to put it there like a leg under a table, so they're going to fit the contour of the body. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit this down roughly at a 45 degree angle. You see that angle? All right, here I go again. Now, I used to laugh and call it the joy of dyslexia. All right, you see how if I do this right, and I'm overdue to be right, okay, now... You see how I've created a V? That's how, like a boat fitting in a trailer, that's how the body is going to fit in there. If we do everything right. What's well, the odds that I'm going to do everything right? Some people tune in every week just to see me make a mistake. And I try not to disappoint my loyal fans. I mean, I, it keeps me mortal. Alrighty. Now, you see how the body is going to fit in there? Now, if I tried to connect the body now, and it's looking pretty good, probably the weight would make the legs begin to move. Now, some of you veterans, the people that work clay, you know this. When clay is finished and fired, as I mentioned earlier, it's got a ring to it, very strong, that's bisque. When we first begin to work with it, the clay is in what we call the wet stage. Well, there's two stages between wet and fired, and that is the leather hard stage, and that's when clay is roughly like a bar of soap. It's got some strength to it, and it won't bend quite so easy. You can sculpt it good. Then after we put this together when it's leather hard, then we will let it get bone dry, and then I'm going to add the head to it, and I'll probably uh, make the head as a separate unit and put them all together. Now, we know when we add things together, we do what we call score and slip. And so I'm scratching up the surfaces to be added together, 
and the slip is going to be like the brick mason putting cement between the bricks. Now this is going to be a little weird. You've got to trust me on this. And this is important, and I run into a lot of people why I use the term right brain because you're visual thinkers and they're always ahead of you because they're imagining faster than your hands can go. And one of the bad jokes that I constantly tell is there was this really uh, hyperactive right brain lady that was trying to be a cook. And every time she fixed her husband a birthday cake, it really messed up because the candles always melted in the oven. Now the reason for that joke is you don't put the candles on until it comes out of the oven. There is a sequence, step one, step two, step three. Right brain visual thinkers are always in a hurry because they're imagining things faster than they can tell you or others and they think everybody in real time is in surreal time. Now the reason I told you all that is instead of making this the way I should with the legs on the ground, the way we walk, and the body up, I'm going to make it upside down. Now there's a reason for everything that I do. Not necessarily a good reason, but there is a reason. Now, you see how it's fitting into the body as a cradle, like I mentioned? I'm opening up this top. We did this technique before when we did piggy banks. And what you have to remember is when the two legs come together, they make that little butt crack of dawn. All right, so these two legs should make the cleavage of the rear. Okay, now remember I told you I put the wrinkles in. The air is going to be able to go in. I'm making this top edge thin, and I've got the slip on there, and I've slipped these already, and it's working pretty doggone good. Now the shoulder blade comes up higher, and when I first made this, one of my chief critics uh, came and said, you know, the legs are too long on this, Joe. And I said, well, you've got to figure in the shrink factor. The body's going to be pressing down, that's going to contort them, and then the clay shrinks about 10 to 15 percent when it dries. Okay? So what I'm going to do now is, and this sounds strange, but I have to make it wrong so it'll end up right. I can't start at the end, I have to start at the beginning. And when I'm dealing with young people, they're always angry because they want to start at the end, i.e. eat their dessert first. Okay. We're down to pretty short time. I got about as much done as I thought I could for one session. You guys are going to have to tune in next week when we put the head on here and the trunk and the tail and all the other things. Now, let's just see. <laughs> I know it looks funny. Don't mean to be weird. I did find out one interesting thing that elephants sleep standing up. Okay, well that's interesting. But here was the part I read in several books, and I'm not trying to be weird on you guys. They sometimes remain standing after they're deceased. Isn't that something? That is wild. Now, baby elephants will lay down to sleep, but adult elephants sleep standing up. Quite a few animals do. I'll see you again next week, and we'll put the head on here, okay? i got to whack him on the bottom. I'll have this all fixed. Come back next time. We'll put the head on. <laughs>